adorned with rows of matching widely spaced sapphires or emeralds, or used to display elaborate pectoral jewelry for those who have the wealth to own such. Welcome back to another Realms Lore video. I am here with the original creator of the Forgotten Realms, Ed Greenwood. And today we're talking about something that I obviously know very much about, which is high fashion, my friends. Oh my no, God! You wanna fill him in a little bit, Ed? Sure. Okay, and I'm here with Ivan. And we are going to present to you high fashion in Waterdeep then and now, then being just before the spell plague ruined everything, and now being just before 1500 DR in the realm. So. If you want to be fashionably dressed, men or woman or not sure, in the realms, in Waterdeep, this is the video you have to see. <laughs> so if you're enjoying these realms lore videos, please consider stopping by at patreon.com slash edgreenwood. The support from the Patreon is what allows us to continue making these videos here for you. And uh, on that, let's check out some, some fashion statements in Waterdeep, huh? Mm -hmm. High fashion in Waterdeep, then and now. Yes, Realms aficionados, it's fashion time, which is something of a joke in Waterdeep, a busy and cosmopolitan trading city where anything goes and practical working dress is the daily rule for much of the population, whereas the nobility pursue their own interests and tastes, setting their own fashions and not caring about what others think or are wearing. Yet. What are the wannabe nobles, the wealthy non-nobles who might be aging and no longer fresh, a beautiful or a handsome, but still wanting to be admired and seduced and thought important and influential? Well, for them, fashion is very real, and even when we set aside passing fads of the moment, there are lasting trends we can see. So what are they? in what folk, if not sages and historians, call the High Time, the 1370s up to the onset of the Spell Plague in 1385, and then again in the Now, the current realm's time, the 1490s DR. It should be noted that in both of these time periods, Waterdavian fashion is echoed with a mere handful of local variations in Tethyr, Cormir, and Sembia. The High Time. In these decades, feminine fashion in Waterdeep has been trending from ruffles and flounces, pleated and shaped cloth decorations often looking like flowers, <laughs> sewn onto the hips and shoulders of gowns and made of the same cloth as the main garment, towards clean lines and V fronts with yokes and shoulder padding holding apart the top of the V and stomachers, cummerbund like belts and sashes covering the waist and anchoring the point or bottom of the V. At the same time, ankle-length gowns have been rising to mid-calf to show off high boots, often side-laced or with ornate cutouts, and the cloth they're cut from has been moving from rich soft blues and flame orange and pastels to shimmer weave and other satin finish hues from soft rose, what we in the real modern world call Ashes of Roses, through deep blush, redder than pink, to crimson and scarlet. Those who don't want to wear red instead go to plum or royal purple, or if in mourning or conservative, usually also elderly, go for black with white or silver trim, sidelines running up the hips or edges of lapels for the V-front or both. The bared breast area created by the V-front might at some revels be left bare save for rows of fine chain crossing it, often adorned with rows of matching widely spaced sapphires or emeralds, or used to display elaborate pectoral jewelry for those who have the wealth to own such. A nipples are usually covered with wide vertical ribbons of either matching material to the gown or a shade darker or lighter for contrast. Underwear is a short skirt over the usual breech clout made of material to match the main gown. Earrings are trending from large dangling pendants to small earlobe jewels in gold or silver settings and trending from 
hand webs of gem adorned rings worn on the three outer fingers and linked by fine chains that run over the back of the hand to each other to lone large jewel rings worn on the middle finger only. Wedded status is marked at this time by plain band silver hued thumb rings, partners being denoted by each wearing a ring adorned with an engraved monogram of the first letters of their given names entwined. Masculine fashion at the beginning of the high time consists of ornate doublets with slashed and pleated upper sleeves over the biceps, mated to tight fitting forearm sleeves, the upper sleeves toggle button fastening over the tight fitting sleeves, both sets of sleeves being separate garments from the doublets, which have padded epaulette like shoulders that overlap. The tight sleeves, these tight sleeves and the doublets being of matching materials so as to look like one garment, whereas the upper sleeves are of contrasting hues, or at least the insides of the pleats always are, worn over knee-length single-hue breeches with plain cods of the same material as the pants, all worn over a darker single-hue stocking and ornate laced boots. Throughout the high time, these shift to match the feminine trend towards V-fronts and the breeches grow longer to entirely cover the darker stocking and be tucked into bucket-topped just below the knee boots. So the doublets give way to lighter, simpler shirts with their own attached loose and full sleeves and reinforced double thickness shoulder and breast yokes to hold the V open and to line its edges on both sides down to broad black leather belts, usually festooned with pouches of matching material covering the waist and holding in stomachs. The bared front is left for the world to see. Some men shaved, and some showed off their chest hair, and the luckiest of all displayed their sword scars to impress. As one elf trader visiting Waterdeep infamously observed, humans are impressed by the oddest things. In chilly or wet weather, men not wanting the discomfort of bared chests covered their fronts with ricotta, R-A-K-K-A-T-A, clip-on stiff collars overlapping tongues stiffened with metal opening at the back clips on around the throat that are attached to a pleated flaring hanging heavy linen front looking for all the world like a very large serviette or napkin tucked in at the throat and flared out to cover the front down below the waist like cloaks ricottas were customarily doffed when entering the city warmth of a dwelling men or rings, large or small, but little other jewelry save for holy symbols on fine neck chains displayed by clergy, paladins, and the very devout throughout the high time. The now. So, let us now flash forward, as they say, over the chaos and tumult of the main spell plague and the years of renewal that followed and see the trends in Waterdeep arising in the 1470s DR and continuing to the present moment within hailing distance of 1500 DR. Over these decades, feminine fashion in Waterdeep begins with above-the-knee tunic dresses with yokes, usually of cotton, and sometimes worn over ankle-length chemises of lighter hue, with strap-on shoes very like modern real-world ankle-strap bridal dance shoes. From this, the trend is to what's called the Alark, after Machesia Hallark, a female fashion designer of Trades Ward who created it. This look, and the word look, by the way, is now used in the deep to describe a sort of fad or fashion, consists of ankle length, long sleeved great coats worn open over high boots, form fitting dark breeches very like the hose worn by men for centuries, complete with modest same material as the breeches but often decorated with gold thread designs cod pieces and white cotton short sleeves chemises with white underbust front laced corsets over them both the chemise and the corset are usually embroidered with colorful designs and pendant jewelry or necklaces are displayed in the open throat of the chemise 
hats are seldom worn except in bad weather, but what the real world called crispines, network caps, shaped like bags or hairnets fashioned of silk or gold or silver mesh, the forerunners of the more elaborate crispinets or calls, Water Davian women never wear their hair coiled over their ears in ram's horns, are increasingly popular. Those women who let their hair fall free sometimes wear tiara-like hair combs. Masculine fashion in Waterdeep over these decades begins with dark plain-hued hip planks tailored coats very like real-world bandis or Nehru jackets. So, having mandarin collars, except that they weren't sleeveless but had wrist-length sleeves, ending in reinforced, to stop rucking and curling, points on the outside wrist. No one in the deep as Murreth, M-U-R-R-E-T-H, Murreth, these were worn over dark hose and pointed toes, soft fabric, but hard-soled, dark boots that were often adorned on the insteps with diamonds or other glitter-cut gems like moonstones or zircons. Fashion then trends from such wear to thigh-length tunics, belted at the waist and adorned with contrasting thread designs down the breast, with a V, a small V-shaped neck that is covered when the tunic is worn by a large buckler-like medallion, pinned to the sides of the tunic neck but sometimes, if it is large and ornate enough, at the same time worn on a neck chain to take its weight. When I say ornate enough, it may bear the relief likeness of a snarling lion or a smiling dragon or some other beast or monster. I want to reiterate that these fashions are revel and feast and club wear for the flamboyants, the dandies and show-offs who want to impress and to advertise their wealth and importance. Merchants, shopkeepers and crafters will avoid these excesses and will dress in more practical garb and the looks that they believe suit them. Hi, welcome back to Realm Speak, and this time around we're tackling this. Mephistopheles. Yes, Mephistopheles, the devil. Yeah, um, if, if you remember your Faust and you don't want to make a Faustian bargain, well then you won't deal with Mephistopheles. And that's the real world legendary derivation for this, this particular entity entering D&D, therefore the realms, Mephistopheles. Perfect. Great job, man. Whoo! Boy. Whoo! Hey. Yeah.